today we're going to talk about uh, the Q1 Internet Security Report, so the security report for last quarter. But before we do, let me and Mark introduce ourselves. If we have, if you've, this is the first time you've joined this ISR podcast, I'm Corey Nockreiner, the Chief Security Officer and previous CTO of WatchGuard Technologies. Uh, as you can tell, I now run security for WatchGuard itself along with Mark, although both me and Mark were also folks that run the WatchGuard Threat lab a group or organization of security experts that kind of keep our thumb on the pulse of the threat landscape and write content and recommendations to to help our customers and really anyone in the world understand the threat landscape and protect themselves against it but i'll let mark introduce him and his team as well yeah mark the liberty uh, so i like corey mentioned help run internally security internal security at WatchGuard as well as helping manage our, our threat research team at the threat lab uh, we also help out with product security as well, too, uh, leading our product security incident response team, so vulnerability management and bug bounties. We get to wear a lot of hats in cybersecurity, and it certainly keeps the day uh, quite fun every single week. Uh, but it's not just us that were authors on this report. Uh, we also had our whole team help out as well, too, with various sections in it. Um, and beyond them, we get the help of our product and engineering teams in helping acquire and tabulate the data uh, that we view and uh, um, report on within this report and this webinar. Uh, it really takes an entire effort every quarter to put this out, and it could not be, well, it used to be accomplished by just Corey and I, but man, that really stunk back then. Love having the help on it instead. Cool. Uh, yeah, fantastic team. Uh, we couldn't do this without them and many other folks at WatchGuard. Uh, so, oops, get back on the screen. What will we be covering today? Well, the agenda is quite simple. We're we're pretty much going to give you highlights from the report, although we hope you go read the full full report as well. We always start with the Firebox feed. Uh, Mark will talk a little bit more about what this is, but really, our entire report. One of the reasons I like it is its primary intelligence from WatchGuard. It's generated by different products, and as you might tell by the name, the Firebox feed comes from our network security appliance. Whether you call it a next generation firewall or a unified threat management appliance, it's basically a, a advanced firewall that has many other network security services. So by monitoring those security services with customers that opt in, we can talk about the top malware, the top types of network attacks, what domains folks might be clicking on behind fireboxes and give you a lot of intelligence about what network security is catching each quarter. But as someone that also has WatchGuard EPDR, our uh, advanced endpoint protection and endpoint detection and response solution, we also can do the same for endpoint related threats. We have millions of legacy uh, Panda Active Directory clients out there and now millions of WatchGuard EPDR clients as well. So using that telemetry, we we can also dive into what types of threats we see happening on the endpoint. But finally, as we always say, the point of this really isn't just to talk about threats, although that's what you're going to hear most about. It's to understand how those threats work so that you can have the proper defenses. So we're really just keeping our thumb on this pulse to see what's changing, to keep track of the, the health and telemetry of network and endpoint security so we can make slight adjustments like your, I don't know, your doctor does every quarter or so to make sure that you can keep your network uh, healthy. So with that, let's go a little bit more. Let's dive into the fire box feed, but Mark can start out by introducing what it is. Yeah, just in case you're new to the webinar and you're not familiar with uh, the concept of the Firebox feed, like Corey mentioned, it is an opt-in telemetry source for us from WatchGuard Firebox customers around the world. Uh, if you are someone that manages a WatchGuard Firebox, uh, either your own or as a managed service provider, we do encourage you to check the checkbox saying send device feedback to WatchGuard. Uh, our product management team can get some uh, useful telemetry to figure out which products and services are most in use uh, so they can focus engineering efforts. But from our perspective in the Threat Lab, uh, we get telemetry for any security service detection on the Firebox. It's all anonymized um, from your end. Uh, we just get to see the type of threat that was triggered, um, some information about where the threat may have come from, and we can use that to build this picture of the threat landscape globally. Uh, in the Firebox feed, we include a few different services. So there's three layers of anti-malware included in this. Gateway Antivirus is our legacy signature-based anti-malware service that still does a great job of quickly and catching known threats. 
But as you'll see later on in here, signature-based antivirus is not well positioned to catch all modern malware threats out there. So to back that up, we also use Intelligent AV, which is a machine learning based AI, uh, AV engine. I guess it is technically AI if we're going to throw that buzzword out there as well too. Uh, Intelligent AV does a great job of quickly predicting whether a file is going to be good or bad by using a trained model that's been trained up on millions of known good and known bad files. I would even yeah. say tens of millions. <laughs> Yeah, behind that, we've got APT Blocker, which is our sandbox-based behavioral engine, where if a file gets through Gateway Antivirus and Intelligent AV, we still have this last strong line of defense where we send it up to a secure cloud sandbox and detonate it, watch the behaviors, and then report back on the Firebox whether that file is good or bad. Um, beyond anti-malware engines, we also have the Intrusion Prevent Protection Service, or IPS, uh, which is a signature-based service for detecting network-based exploits or exploit attempts. Could be attacks against a web service that you're hosting and protecting behind the Firebox, or it could be attacks against your users' web browsers as they browse outbound through the Firebox as well, too. Everything from network-connected applications to services that are exposed to the internet can be protected by the IPS engine. And then finally, we've got the DNS Watch service, which is a DNS firewalling and filtering service primarily used to protect your users against phishing attacks. Uh, we include dozens of threat feeds, including some of our own curated ones and third-party feeds to quickly identify known phishing associated domains. And instead of allowing that connection to that malicious domain, we can redirect it to a secure black hole instead too. It's not just yep. phishing though, it can also protect against botnet command and control connections as well too. Um, so when we get to that part of this webinar, you'll see a few malware-related detections. As yeah, well. malware compromised sites and many others too. Before I, we transition, Mark covers some of the highlights, just because I like taking questions as they come. This question actually probably has very little to do with the ISR report, but since our team kind of monitors threats, I'll ask it anyways. Uh, basically, one of our uh, audience is asking, I heard that Russian hackers intruded into US government sites and Starlinks. Is it true? Uh, I will say in our, our internet security report, by the way, we're starting to see many nation state activities or hacking groups that are actually in Russia and China in some cases. But to your question about Russia hacking government sites and Starlink, uh, certainly nation state actors are definitely one of the main threat actors out there. Uh, everyone knows about the Ukraine-Russia war that is going on right now. Uh, the news you're referring to about Starlink, if I remember right, it's, it's a little older news. I think it was the end of 2022. Uh, Elon Musk and his businesses basically offered to help Ukraine get Starlink satellites to keep their internet infrastructure going during early attacks on, on you know, things like network lines and stuff like that. And uh, apparently Starlink's been working very well for them. But of course, Starlink is just a radio transmission. So there's rumors and news articles about Russian adversaries trying to jam those signals. And there's been many, many cases of Russia, uh, you know, uh, alleged Russian threat actors attacking US government sites and frankly, vice versa. I would say pretty much any state, even ones that I, I'm part of and love, uh, do this type of stuff too. So definitely these nation state threat actors are interesting and we sometimes see data from those type of actors in our report. But moving on, Mark's gonna cover highlights and I'll, Mark will discuss, uh, you, you're going to notice if you're an internet security report reader that we really changed the way we do it. Mark's gonna discuss this in kind of statistical detail, but basically to give you a little analogy is we're always trying to find new views on the data we have. Uh, I don't know if you've ever like been in a city for a long period of time and gotten to know it from the street level, but maybe one day there's a mountain next to the city and you do a hike to the peak, or there's a big skyscraper that you've never been to the top of, but you suddenly go to the top of it. And at that high new perspective, you look down on this city that you've known maybe for years and you see new things. Uh, maybe you see in the middle of what looked like these industrial warehouses, there's a little sanctuary garden that you never went and saw because it's surrounded by warehouses. Or 
or maybe there was this forest and you didn't see a beautiful path that was going through it because the trees were blocking. Maybe things that seem separated from each other, you found some sort of connection from the higher vantage point. So just to give you an idea of why we did this change is the theme of our report this quarter for a new year is a new perspective trying to look back at our data in a new way. And with that, Mark, why don't you cover some of the highlights and some of the statistical reasoning for the change? Yeah, so one of the major changes we made is to enable us to view a statistically meaningful trend quarter after quarter after quarter. If you remember from previous reports, we tended to report on the just total volume of detections everywhere, whether it be the total volume of malware, the total volume of network attacks. And while that's still an important number to understand, because the number of reporting devices, that denominator, can fluctuate every single quarter, it makes it difficult to track meaningful trends uh, just on the face of it. So for this quarter, you know, new year, new me, uh, we decided to, instead of reporting just on raw numbers, give you a view specifically of detections per device. Because no matter how much that denominator, the number of devices reporting in fluctuates, the detections per device is a stat that we can track every single quarter to follow trends. So for this quarter in the malware landscape, we found that the average Firebox appliance out there detected 932 average malware hits per device over the course of the quarter, which, you know, this isn't the tens of millions of raw detections that we would typically talk about in this section. But if you think about it, your network, your organization that's protected by a Firebox just shy of a thousand malware uh, potential malware attacks against it could have been blocked at the point. Can I add some context to that too? And you can find this in the executive summary. Uh, we really like this perspective change for why Mark said, and it will give you a better idea. Like before that millions number is really a global view. This will give you a better idea of what you as a IT administrator might be looking at at one site. That said, we did a little extrapolation. So we imagined not all fireboxes in the world, but just the 80,000 or so that we're reporting in. What if all of them had all our malware detection services? that 932 per firebox would turn into 72.7 million detections. So the huge number is still there. Malware, 72 million point seven malware samples is still there. We're just giving you a new view that gives you a better idea of your specific box. Sorry for the interruption, Mark. How dare you? And so when we split this out <laughs> over the individual malware uh, engines, one thing we keep a note is that not every device has every malware engine licensed or enabled. Uh, and some of them, like our legacy uh, tabletop devices, they may not actually run Intelligent AV as an example. Um, so we keep that in mind as we view the statistics. But of devices that have these services licensed and enabled, we found that the average device uh, detected 236 threats using Intelligent AV. Uh, and then 332 threats per device uh, with APT blocker itself. So you can already get a picture of, if you're relying just on signature-based anti-malware, how some threats might be able to slip through uh, because modern day malware is highly evasive and easy to make evasive by even freely available tools. And we'll get into another stat that kind of highlights this even better a little bit later in the report. Um, I do see- And if I can pop- uh, we can answer in just the a little content bit. inspection. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to do the same. Yeah, yeah. I just, so we're, me and Mark are going the same place. I forgot. I, I said I would answer it live in a moment, so I've killed the question. But somebody was asking what the value of content inspection is, and kind of uh, what intelligent AV APT blocker IPS is too. And first, the numbers, at least looking here, minus content inspection, you can kind of get an idea of the value of the different services in catching that 932. But for content inspection, me and Mark. Mark, I would assume, are, are assuming that you're talking about HTTPS or SSL TLS deep packet inspection. Was that where you were going, Mark? <laughs> I assume so, yes. Yeah, yeah. So going to the next slide uh, the, that Mark was going to allude to before I get rudely interrupted, another big number we have is our zero-day malware statistic for network traffic. 
And really quickly here, we do this every time, so boring to people that have heard this. This has nothing to do with zero-day exploits. Uh, when most of the internet security industry talks about zero-day, they're mostly talking about software vulnerabilities. And a zero-day is one that, that a threat actor, presumably, or a researcher has found before a vendor had a patch. And it's zero-day the day it's found, uh, and until it's patched, days are passing. But for zero-day malware, what we're describing there is malware that signatures don't catch on day one. A lot of traditional antivirus and even the majority of antivirus catching the bulk volume of threats is signature-based. We see a threat, after we see a threat, we write a pattern to catch it. But Mark greatly described how Intelligent AV and APT Blocker are able to catch malware without human interaction that has never been seen before. So to get the zero day malware number, we basically compare how much our basic antivirus, our signature based antivirus catches, and we then compare that to how much APT blocker and IAV catch. And that's how we come up with this prevent, this basically percentage of malware that was not caught, was literally missed by signature services. By the way, hindsight's always 2020. I wish we had fixed this in the real report, but the zero day percentage this quarter was 70%, so a very high percentage. Uh, if you only use basic AV, you would only be catching 30% of the malware out there. Now I say, I say I apologize for this because the next thing I'm going to give you has to do with the content inspection question. And when we look, you know, content inspection, what is that? Well, most of the internet traffic out there is encrypted nowadays. I would suspect 99% of the sites you go to are HTTPS sites, they have that lock icon, and TLS is being used to encrypt all the information between your client and, and the, the, the server you're going to. Now, the problem with that from a security perspective is if you do not take action and set up things on the firewall, you're not going to be inspecting that traffic with all these services we're talking about. You have to uh, install our basically deep packet inspection, our TLS algorithm, application layer gateway, to, to see inside that traffic. And when you do, for the customers that are looking at that traffic, the zero day number goes up. We find that 93% of the malware going through HTTPS connections are actually zero day malware that is getting past signature based store uh, services. So two morals to the story for this slide. One is basic AV is good. It's quick at catching the noise, but nowadays so much malware is programmatically polymorphic. Bad guys are taking the same threats and changing them just a little to get past signatures or using other more advanced evasion techniques. So if you want a chance at catching the bulk of the malware out there, whether over encrypted channels or non encrypted channels, you need things like machine learning, like advanced behavior or, or malware behavioral detection sandboxes, which are the things IV and APT blocker provide. But to the listener, that asked the content inspection question, it's an excellent question because one of the worries we have is only about 20% of our customers are enabling TLS content inspection. Meanwhile, we believe the bulk of malware activity is happening through that encrypted connection. It's, it makes sense. When you're on the web all day, you're mostly in that encrypted connection. So if you're not taking the time to scan that traffic, you really want to consider why. Uh, I don't know if uh, there's other questions, Mark. Should I go ahead to the next one and look at them or anything we can answer now? Uh, let's go ahead to the next one. And then uh, I want to highlight one more stat for in the line of content inspection as well, too. So we're not highlighting it in this webinar, but it's in the report itself. And we actually took a look at malware detections that arrived over an encrypted connection. And when we extrapolate out the stat, we basically found that 96.4% of malware detections arrive over one of these TLS encrypted connections. Meaning if you're not doing content inspection, you're missing more than nine tenths of all the malware that's out there at the perimeter. And yes, hopefully you've got strong endpoint protection and EDR installed on your endpoints, but then you're just rely relying on that single layer of protection and missing out all of the protection at the perimeter as well too. So I get that you know, it's not exactly an easy button checkbox to enable content inspection on network security appliances, but it's one that is absolutely worth the time investment in terms of payback and security. Um, so when we look at the top malware threats by volume for the quarter, 
you'll notice we actually had a few new ones pop up in here, uh, but there's a few trends I wanted to point out. So first off, at the perimeter, we tend to see the very first stage of a malware threat, and we're able to detect and block it right then and there, which is why when you look at malware categories of our top block threats, they tend to be the dropper files, the stagers, so on and so forth. There's also a few in here labeled as phishing, which are in general, either malware directly associated with phishing or a attachment or the content of an email that comes through the network security appliance that we're able to detect and block as well too. Malware these days, uh, I think, I don't remember the stat off the top of my head, but the overwhelming majority of breaches originate with a fish of some sort. Malware itself tends to be multi-staged as well too, uh, which is why we see these kind of initial droppers and stagers at the perimeter. Good news is I believe in a here. presentation we've done, Mark, a trend micro said something like either 94 or 90 per, 94 or 95% of malware start with emails like phishing yep. and, and malicious spam. So that's probably the one you're talking about. Exactly. Um, there's one specific threat in here that we want to highlight for this quarter, though. Uh, comes in at number three by volume. It's the Linux Downloader.ak um, malware family. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, naming conventions for detections, uh, you can typically get some familiarity with what type of threat it is just based off of the name of the detection we have in there. This one is clearly targeted towards Linux-based operating systems uh, uh, computers. Uh, it is a downloader, so usually that first stage of threat that if it's able to gain a foothold, it will go download something else and deliver it onto the endpoint. Could be ransomware, could be a crypto miner, could be a remote access Trojan, basically enables those threat actors to then sometimes even sell this access on the underground for someone else to use and drop their malware they want on it. With this Linux downloader one specifically though, uh, it's a, a type of worm that actually runs a bash script and downloads in most of the samples we saw a crypto miner. And some of them, it does create a, a remote access Trojan, a backdoor on that host to facilitate additional malware delivery or activity. Uh, but if you review the report, we actually, I think, go into a full page and a half investigation of this specific threat because it was pretty interesting. We were actually able to link it to a specific threat actor uh, organization called 8220 Gang, which is a China-based, not necessarily China state-sponsored, but at least China-based threat actor. Uh, we identified a reused command and control domain with previous known activity with that APT group. Uh, when this malware runs, it does a few things, first and foremost, on the endpoint. It'll try to disable any EDR that's running on it. It'll try and disable the built-in Linux firewall, uh, UFW. Um, it tries to remove any uh, security libraries that may be executed when you run a program on there. Um, and then it goes and downloads a secondary payload, which is just a Python script. Uh, that Python script can download additional payloads. Like I said, we saw crypto miners, Trojans. Um, theoretically, it could be used for ransomware as well, too. Uh, another interesting tidbit on this one, though, so it specifically disables uh, Alibaba Cloud-related services on the endpoint. So Alibaba Cloud, think of it similar to, you know, like Azure or Microsoft, or maybe you've got uh, desktop-based applications for interacting with these services. That includes some protection and identity-based services, too. And this specifically hunts Mark, down I think the... like like think of Alibaba as the website like Amazon's website and Ali Yoon, I think, is the Alibaba cloud that's like AWS and the stuff you just mentioned. Exactly. Ali Yoon. Which is interesting because we don't typically see China based malware or APTs targeting China based services which leads us to believe that this is primarily geared towards at least Southeast Asian victims that probably use these services. Uh, you bet obviously Alibaba and Aliyun aren't massively popular in the Western world, but it is very popular in Eastern world. And yeah, so in Southeast that, Asia, there's a lot of Mandarin speaking countries that speak Mandarin, Singapore, Malaysia, like there, there's countries where, where you could see them targeting non-China Southeast Asian countries that would still use those services. Exactly. Um, so there's other uh, malware threats we highlight in the report as well, too. For time's sake, we aren't going to dive into all of them in just this webinar. Highly recommend checking it out in the report if you want to nerd out a little bit on some of the threats that we've seen over the quarter. 
So Mark, that was cool stuff on the malware section, but to, to keep going with questions, uh, although maybe unrelated, uh, a Dave asked, is it possible to have this type of quarterly data near real time? And the answer is absolutely yes. Although I will say the caveat is we're in the process of updating where you can get it uh, or, or updating the data set where you get it so that it more matches the new format of our report. But basically, if you haven't gone to secplicity.org, uh, that's the Threat Labs blog where me, Mark, and all our authors put a lot of content, including our podcast, the 443 Security Simplified podcast. But there's a tab there called Threat Landscape. And that tab allows you to go back through all the data we've had through the years, pick different dates, pick a specific country. We haven't put it down to city yet, but we can can, and it will regenerate that data live. It, it's technically, I think, Mark, actually, you might only have it a few hours behind. It used to be 24 hours behind. Is that still true, Mark? It is one hour delayed now. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's relatively real time. Do know because we keep making changes to make our report more statistically relevant, including uh, starting to do things where we 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 strip out any anom anomalies that don't fit into nine, the 95 percentile. That hasn't necessarily been done on the data in, in the live threat landscape yet. So you'll see more updates to that. But if you want a general sense of the, the live version of it, or you want to generate longer periods of time, definitely check out cyclicity.org uh, threat landscape. Uh, just following up on a uh, uh, you know state-sponsored actor question, one person was asking, is it possible to block incoming traffic from Russia or mainland China with a firebox? Absolutely. I mean, we have geo-blocking. You can block traffic from any region of the world. The follow-up, though, is geo-blocking enough? I actually... We put geo-blocking features in there because people request them. As a security expert, I think they're worthless. Uh, one, there's businesses, legitimate businesses in those places too. But more importantly, every state-sponsored actor knows how to proxy in VPN. They're never coming from Russia. They have their hacking service in other locations or using proxy services, the same private VPNs we do. They're pumping their traffic through Tor. Real state-sponsored Russian actors are coming from Tor. They're anonymizing themselves and coming from different locations. So there's reasons to use geo-blocking, but I think the ones that think you're going to block a certain world attack by blocking a region, I just don't think it's possible. It's nothing wrong with the feature. The feature works great at blocking places, you know, blocking traffic technically from that area, but it's too easy to come from everywhere on the internet. But let's continue on, and I will very quickly, because it's not quite as interesting this quarter, cover network attacks. So this is all comes from our intrusion pro protection service. This, this service, as Mark already highlighted, catches vulnerabilities in software, whether server or client. And I would say, if you look at our top 10, like 90% of the time, probably even 99% of the time, they're web-based network services, whether they're client or server, whether they're you going with your browser or a someone attacking a web server or web application. Most of the attacks we see are web-based. That's where the battleground are. But it could be any network attacks as well. And going with the new way we're actually consolidating to th things to per firebox, on average, uh, individual firebox blocked about 460 different software intrusions, exploits uh, in Q1. Here is the top 10 list. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on the top 10 list. Um, what happens with network attacks every quarter is we tend to see the same suspects or the same general suspects every single quarter. They might all move up and down between number one and 10, but a lot of them are, are, are there. Uh, so there's not much change. And the reason we've always stated for this is we believe a lot of this is generated from different types of mass scans. Botnets, when they infect a computer, a lot of the things the threat actor does is get them to scan internet addresses looking for vulnerabilities in other IPs on the internet. And they tend to scan for the same exploits over and over. On top of that, you have pro uh, services like Shodan that are always scanning the internet for open ports and looking for things. But more specifically, you have vulnerability, uh, vulnerability management software out there 
that good guys use sometimes against their own external interface or sometimes pen testers use in tests to try to find vulnerabilities being exposed by companies on the internet. We believe these automated scans are really what are triggering the same exploits over and over. But to throw out a few new, or at least one new detection in the top 10, you can see that the number one type of an attack that was being caught is a specific type of SQL injection attack. Whenever you see a, a, a web SQL injection attempt type signature trigger, it's one of many somewhat generic SQL injection technique detectors. SQL injection can, can happen in many different ways. Uh, if you have a custom web application, the way you might trigger something is slightly different, but there's, there's you know, things that happen every single time, whether you're going after one specific software or one class of SQL injection attack. So as you can see by the 17.a, we have tons of different kind of generic SQL injection detectors, but when we, uh, detecting signatures. But when we looked at this, uh, this particular SQL SQL injection exploit, while it worked, the, the, the CVE related to it could work with a, a number of different web application packages. One example is something called Open EMR, which is an open source medical practice management software. Uh, so just something a healthcare provider would have on the internet on a web server to, to basically help manage their web practice and maybe remote administration of that too. Now it's an old vulnerability too. This was a vulnerability that was patched way back in 2013, but it shows that even when vulnerabilities are old, bad guys still look for them. And unfortunately, and you can see this maybe happening in a small medical office even more often than you would a, a tech company, there is old software out there that's not patched. Uh, another interesting thing we saw was not on the top 10 list, but as the author of this particular section, Josh, because the top 10 list is so regular, we sometimes go deeper. And in this case, within the top 30s, we found an attack against WatchGuard's uh, TMG, basically a very, um, WatchGuard, Ooh, that was a Freudian slip, <laughs> Microsoft's TMG. And is that, I think that was the threat management gateway is the actual acronym for that. But essentially it's just Microsoft's software firewall. It was a server package you could buy from Microsoft back in the 2000s. Uh, so it was their firewall. Now this is something Microsoft doesn't sell anymore. This is long past end of life, really, really old, but it was a vulnerability that targeted and gained control of Microsoft firewall software. Uh, and the, the author, Josh, did a quick showdown lookup and it turns out, despite the fact that Microsoft doesn't even release or support re support this anymore. There are still dozens of these publicly on the internet right now. So it was just interesting. In this case, this particular researcher, uh, I'm like a, old, a super old man, so I know, I feel like I know the history of all security software. He didn't even know Microsoft had the TMG firewall, so that's why he was interested. So it's kind of interesting to know there's many still out there on the internet. But moving on, oops, went a little too far. Why don't you cover some of the region stuff, Mark? There was one last interesting stat from the network attack section. And so in the report for both malware and network attacks, we break out uh, regionally at an extremely high level. So Americas, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific, um, what their share of the overall threats are. And for the last year, in fact, since Q2 2022, We've been seeing the share of network attacks targeting the Americas, so North, Central, and South America, continue to trend up. In this quarter, that crossed the 50% threshold. So more than half of all the network attacks we saw were targeting victims within the Americas. We don't know exactly why they're getting the overwhelming majority of them at this point now, um, but it's just one thing to keep in mind that not all attacks are distributed equally out there, um, when it especially when it comes to network attacks. Uh, before we dive into the next session, there's two uh, quick questions I want to answer that are relevant to what we just discussed. Uh, the first one was uh, asking, is there a reason that SSL inspection is not enabled out of the box uh, or just a checkbox to activate? And the biggest reason is there isn't a really easy checkbox way of doing it. You do have to do some certificate management because the Firebox, the network security appliance, is effectively man in the middle in your connection to these websites. And if you were to just check on a checkbox, you would suddenly start getting a untrusted certificate warning 
for every website that you visited. The good news is if you are an Active Directory shop, uh, you already have a certificate authority as a part of that. You can sign a new one, a new certificate signing certificate, import that into the Firebox. That's an easy mode option. Uh, you can also distribute out a certificate using GPO or other remote management tools within an organization. Um, so we've done a lot over the last five, 10 years to improve our documentation, to give you the easy step-by-steps, but it's still a multi-step process and not just a single checkbox, unfortunately. But like I said, even if it isn't as easy as a checkbox to turn on, it is still worth that time investment for the security benefit that you get. Uh, and I, I will say we've designed it to be as easy as possible. We've automated some ex exceptions because uh, one of the other things you'll have to do is make exceptions. So we've tried to make the, the regular ones uh, already built in. So there is work, but we're doing our best to make it as check mark as possible. And then the next one I want to answer, just because it's extremely topical for Corey and I, the question was, uh, what is your Worm strategy GPT? for preparing for more intelligent <laughs> malware like Worm GPT? And I, I say this because if you listen to our podcast, the 443, uh, the episode coming out on Monday next week, we actually discuss Worm GPT and our thoughts on it. Uh, to be clear, Worm GPT itself is not malware. It's basically like a attacker focused or a black hat version of chat GPT. It's like a large language model with all of the guardrails pulled off so you can use it for adversarial activity like writing spear phishing or writing malware. Probably not very good malware. Large language models are good at talking like humans. They're not good at programming like humans. Um, but we do think while Worm GPT itself isn't like a malware threat we have to watch out for, this is something that at WatchGuard we are very focused on because as all of you are probably aware, AI, large language models, just AI in general seems to be the future of technology. And how that evolves is still up to question, but it's an area that we're looking at from a defender standpoint. How do we incorporate this type of technology into our products and services to make them defend better or help you manage them better, but also paying attention to how adversaries are using them and things like social engineering, and even in some cases, enabling uh, lower skilled malware creation. So it is something we're watching. We are highly plugged into it. Mark, ahead, just uh, since there's one more simple one, and it actually is re report specific, I do want to answer it really quickly. And we see more too, by the way, we can get it at the end of the call. But one question was, does the full report break out the OS platforms that are targeted, Win, Mac, and Linux? And the answer is unfortunately no, but it's something we want. What a great question. We want to do it. From a network level, it, it's going to be hard. Uh, you know, from a network level, we're not really necessarily seeing the OS directly. There's things in headers, there's Mac, there's lots of ways we could figure out what it was from the network level, the device. But because we don't have that into the anonymized telemetry data we have, it's going to be very hard in the Firebox feed to do that. The one place we have talked about breaking it out is in our endpoint section, which we're getting to soon. Uh, the endpoint obviously is going to know exactly what OS it is. The challenge we have there is being a anti-malware and endpoint protection product just sales wise our sales are is predominantly windows we obviously have mac and linux clients too and me and mark will tell you if you have a mac you need malware protection it's a well, fallacy Macs that malware <laughs> yeah, you need it there too. But what we'll have to do when we start considering sharing the OS information is finding a way to, to normalize the data by sales. Otherwise, it's going to be overwhelmingly Windows just because customer-wise, it's over overwhelming Windows can, uh, people. So I, I really love the idea of putting that platform information there. It's something we have talked about, but we don't have it right now. But let's move along, Mark, and talk about uh, DNS watch and DNS firewalling. Yeah, so we also get visibility into DNS resolution as a part of the Firebox feed with our DNS watch service. And in the report, we break out three main categories of malicious domains that we take a look at, ones that are associated with malware, so either malware delivery or malware command and control, a category we call compromised websites. So otherwise legitimate websites that have been abused in some way uh, as part of a nefarious purpose, could be it was an exploited WordPress site used to host something, could be a file share site, like an example in here we'll talk about in a second, abused to do something. Uh, but otherwise, a, it has legitimate purposes too. 
Phishing websites, on the other side, on the other hand, were entirely set up for something malicious, typically involved in phishing campaigns against victims or organizations. There's a couple main standouts I wanted to highlight in the malware domains. Uh, the number three threat in there uh, was associated with a malware family called Vipersoft X, which really it feels like my old Xbox Live gamer tag. Uh, but this was an info stealing malware. It's designed to run on your computer and basically scope out the place and figure out information about your operating system, users, group memberships, everything, and then siphon that off to an adversary who can then pick and choose their targets and maybe deliver something more sophisticated eventually. Uh, interesting bit with Vipersoft X though, is while it starts with a binary, after that, everything else runs in PowerShell. Uh, so it's got multiple stages that are effectively just PowerShell scripts that it downloads and executes in memory, doesn't save them on the machine itself. And it allows it to use the tools built into your operating system, that's what's called a living off the land attack, in order to carry out all the bad deeds. Uh, we go into a little more detail in the report of some of the actual um, scripts and their usage as well. Uh, when it comes to compromised websites, there was an interesting one in there at number seven, I think, which was the pump.cat one. So this was actually a legitimate file hosting website. And this is a common trend. We've seen this a few times in the past in the report, where over time, the ad administrator for this website just could not keep up with moderating the content that was uploaded to it. And so threat actors use this effectively free hosting platform to upload malware payloads to it and then send a link or download from that link with their stagers and their droppers and potentially piggybacking off the otherwise good reputation of this domain to carry out malware based attacks. Now, this site was actually taken offline March 31st of this year. Uh, the administrator put up a message basically saying they could not keep up with the moderation. Not only was there malware, there was a ton of other gross uh, illegal material being hosted on it. And instead of just falling and trying to keep up with the wave, they decided to take it all offline, which is not the first time that we've seen something like that in uh, domains that we've highlighted in this report. In the phishing landscape, uh, you'll notice quite a few uh, domains piggybacking off SharePoint's red, uh, good reputation. You can set up as a Microsoft user, I can go register for effectively a free trial account, create my own SharePoint site that's entirely public, register whatever domain name I want as a subdomain, and then host whatever I want on there, files, sites, whatever. So as an attacker, I can set up a phishing website designed to look like Microsoft 365, hosted on a Microsoft owned domain, sharepoint.com, and then use that and send it to victims in a, a phishing email. And it just adds additional layers of credibility that can make it difficult to spot this style of attack. Uh, one other specific threat we saw in here, that was that betsportsstream.com website, uh, which was designed to look like a streaming website. One of those where you, know, you want to watch the World Cup, but you don't have Fox or whatever it was on here in the States. And you might be you know, convinced to go try and put on your pirate hat and see if you can find a stream online. And if you did, you might end up at this website where I think in some cases it did have legitimate streams, but it otherwise abused your access to it to try and trick you into enabling push notifications in your browser, which you've probably seen usually news websites and Facebook that say, do you want to allow notifications? That actually gives that domain a lot of power and they can abuse that to do pop-up after pop-up. Uh, we see them in this style of attack. Uh, they do pop-ups claiming you're infected with malware and go pay $600 for this anti-malware service to uh, clean it up, they'll try and extort you with it. And it's kind of difficult to remove as well too, because as soon as you open Chrome or Safari, you're just inundated with these because you enable that notifications for the website. Uh, we also saw some examples of it redirecting to other uh, domains where it would prompt you to pay for your membership. It could prompt you to log into an account, presumably to steal payment card info or login credentials. It was kind of like a Swiss army knife targeting people that had their pirate hats on trying to look for sports streams. Um, cool stuff, though. Mark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And well, I, I think we're right about to round out the end of the network security section and give you some tips related to, but saw one more question, Doreen, I think from Mandolin. Uh, we've been talking a lot about TLS, SL, uh, TLS SSL inspection or content inspection. And uh, her, I assume her, I'm sorry, I'm making an assumption, but uh, 
well, whatever your pronouns are, you were asking uh, whether or not it's slowed down or if there's an effect on network speed since we're man in the middle in the, the traffic. And that's a very good question. I'd love to answer it. Uh, the cool thing, one thing you should know about RTLS inspection is it's secure. We actually, not only are we decrypting it at the firewall, we're doing it temporarily just to apply security services. We don't want to evade privacy. We're not really trying to give administrators access to the content of that traffic if one of your users is doing the banking site, but that means we also re-encrypt it on the other side. By the time it's got past our firewall, we've both decrypted and encrypted it. So logically thinking, that takes processing resource, right? We're decrypting and re-encrypting re every single time when you're doing that. So it makes sense you ask a question, does it affect network speed? The answer is obviously logically, uh, it, does it uh, affect Firebox resource speed? Obviously, we have to do more work. But I can tell you lately, as long as you size your Firebox to the amount of users you want, it really does not seem to affect network speed today the way it did when we first did it. I've been at WatchGuard far too long. Mark says I ought to get out of here. But you know, I remember when we had to get Rainbow's acceleration chip technologies for encryption and decryption acceleration. And even then we could barely keep up with it and turning on something like TLS inspection would slow down traffic. But nowadays, uh, you know, this encryption acceleration is built in at a chip level. Uh, it is technically more resource effect, uh, you know, more resource needy than not doing it. But I find that it keeps up with traffic speed pretty well. I, I do it in my network, and frankly, you know, the firebox is still going at faster than my ISP speed is. Mark, I don't know if you had any anecdotal or or quantifiable things to add to that. Nope, just uh, parroting what you just said. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and finish the network section just by the whole point, which is the tips. So why don't you start with the first one, Mark? Yeah, and so when it comes to systems administration, we always tend to think of you know malware, or malware targeting Windows machines as a prime target. But you have to remember that, just like Corey said a little bit ago, Mac OS does, in fact, get malware, and so does Linux, too. So you have to make sure you've got endpoint protection and EDR tools installed on all of your systems, regardless of operating system, especially Linux. You know, we talked about that Linux downloader uh, malware file that showed up at number three in our top 10 by uh, volume. And that's not the first time we've seen a non-Windows-based malware show up relatively high in overall volume. I want to actually take one question we saw in here. When we were discussing Linux downloader, a question popped up saying, have we seen a Windows equivalent? If you look back at the top malware by volume, the majority of them are Windows downloaders of some form or another. I think the top one or the second one is actually an MISL, so Microsoft Instruction Language-based malware downloader. So we do see them very frequently. They're just architectured differently because they're geared towards different operating systems. But if you take nothing else away, just remember that, yes, protect your Windows machines, but don't ignore your non-Windows-based systems when it comes to endpoint protection. Uh, Corey, you want to grab the next one? For sure. And this tip uh, we're putting in the network section because of those droppers and stagers that Mark talked about that affect Linux and Windows. But just a lot of the malware detection we see nowadays is script based. And that's because, and we'll talk more about this in the endpoint section, a lot of threat actors are starting to leverage living off the land attacks, where they take advantage of very legitimate tools that are part of operating systems, like the shell scripting capability in Linux, or, or like JavaScript or PowerShell scripting in Windows, to do the things that malware typically used to be done by a executable malware file. So be aware that a lot of these droppers and stagers, they're there to try to use legitimate looking tools that kind of evade traditional security controls, because how do you tell good from bad uh, when you're using a tool that everyone uses? There are ways to tell good from bad, by the way, but you need additional inspection capability. And they, they try to maybe set the stage, that's why they're called stagers, and disable security controls before uh, you know actually downloading the final payload they want to download. And sometimes they can be entirely living off the 
land with fileless malware. So just be aware of threat actors using those techniques. We'll talk a little bit more about it in the endpoint section. And the good news is endpoint products like WatchGuard EPDR can help catch at the last stage some of those living off the land techniques and even network security controls, especially the ones that use machine learning and behavioral analysis might be able to detect in files or, or in scripts before they're executed, some of those activities as well. Go ahead, Mark. The last one, uh, Corey mentioned that open EMR software, an open source medical records keeping software as a targeted application for this quarter. And one of the key takeaways here is understanding that open source has its benefits. You effectively get free applications, but there are drawbacks that come with that too. Typically, you'll lack an enterprise-grade support agreement with these, uh, these different platforms. So if you run into issues, they can be more difficult to solve. Oftentimes, you be, might be surprised that some of the most popular open source libraries and applications are maintained by one or two individuals. And so sometimes it can take some time to identify and quickly respond to vulnerabilities within the applications. So I'm not trying to discount open source entirely. It absolutely has its place as a software engineering company, we use open source within our products because there's no need to rebuild the wheel in most cases. But you have to be aware of the applications and libraries that you use, understand some of the risks behind it, and hopefully have the expertise to address those risks internally. That is the trade-off that you get for effectively free software. So just keep that in mind as you're rolling out or evaluating open source alternatives to potentially paid solutions. For time's sake, though, man, eight minutes. Time for power hour. When it yeah, comes we better to, uh, get we better get going. We don't want to keep you too long. Me and Mark love to talk about little intricacies, so uh, we always take longer going into cool de or details we think are cool. But let's talk about endpoint threats. This data comes from our endpoint uh, uh, products, obviously, like WatchGuard EPDR and uh, Adaptive Defense 360. And the first thing is. With endpoint, we're detecting things in you know hundreds or tens of millions. So to try to make things more consumable is in the per device way we did for Firebox, we kind of normalized all our detections and looked at things in blocks of 100,000 endpoints. Uh, we are, but we first started with maybe. 10,000, or I think maybe even it was a thousand endpoints to try to represent an average mid sized customer. Uh, but just statistically, we were starting to get into percentages. So this all is 100,000 endpoints, even though we're getting data from literally tens of millions of devices out there. So on average, out of 10,000 endpoints, the endpoint product detected about 1,068 pieces of threats or pieces of malware, or you know, in, in some cases, living on no malware, but some sort of indicator of attack associated with malware. And let's dive into a little more detail here, Mark. Yeah, and so we actually also took a look at for the threats that we detected, how many individual systems were impacted by that specific threat. And we actually found that 87% of our alerts, our detections, only impacted a single machine. So a lot of malware these days, it's really easy to hyper-localize it. You can see polymorphic malware where each individual payload is technically different than the other ones, at least from a detection standpoint. This is one of the reasons we see a lot of threats that are only detected on a single host. For uh, alerts that impacted more than 100 endpoints, it was only 195 total for the whole quarter. So only 195 very widespread threats out there. Uh, this means that you need tools capable of detecting not just based off signatures, but off of heuristics and known behaviors too, because otherwise it's impossible to keep up with just signatures if 87% of threats are effectively unique. And when it comes to those detection tools, if you want to go to the next slide, Corey, we also broke out in the report the percentage of our detections by the technology that detected it within EPDR. So EPDR itself has multiple layers of detection technology. Signatures are still the first and foremost one just because they're really quick at catching known threats out there. And we caught 53% of the threats at the endpoint using our signature-based engine in EPDR. But that's still only half of the malware that we saw. Our contextual engine behind that caught 18%. So looking at not just what's running, but how it's running and some of the behaviors around that. For example, you can allow PowerShell execution on an endpoint, but watch for suspicious uh, indicators with that PowerShell execution. Is it disabling the anti-malware scan interface? Is it running in a hidden window? 
these are all red flags that a contextual engine can trigger on and ultimately still block that threat while allowing legitimate usage of that type of application. 11% uh, of the threats that we saw were blocked by cloud classification rules, typically meaning we sent the MD5 or the sample itself up to a cloud-based service to get back a, a result on good or bad. 9% uh, of the threats were rules. And on the endpoint cloud. side of things, by the way, we use our own. We, we, we use machine learning and, and have our own sandboxing locally. Uh, we've partnered with others for the APT blocker, although that's transitioning to our own as well. Sorry, Mark, just wanted to add that little detail. 9% of the threats were blocked by rules created by WatchGuard Labs, which you know we introduced ourselves as the leaders of the WatchGuard Threat Labs. Uh, little naming confusion aside, WatchGuard Labs is our team of malware analysts and reverse engineers uh, behind the endpoint product that every day their job is to see the new trends of malware threats out there and then feed those specific rules and detections back into the product to catch them across our customer base. 8% of the threats were blocked by our attestation service. So we call this the zero trust application service on EPDR. Basically, there's no such thing as a suspicious file in EPDR. Everything is either good or bad in classification. And we do that through these automations here that catch the overwhelming majority of threats on their own. But at the end of the day, 0.02% of malware that doesn't get a definitive thumbs up or thumbs down goes to a human being that will review it, reverse engineer it, and make that de de definitive determination on that threat. That means that you don't have to go out there and review suspicious alerts that you get. You can just allow good applications to run and block everything else. Now, I mentioned 0.02% is the one that ends up to the humans, but as soon as they make that determination, that result goes back into our protection service so that other recipients, other customers, endpoints can benefit from that knowledge. And that's why you saw 8% of threats overall blocked by malware that went through that attestation service. And finally, a relatively small portion of threats, around 1%, were blocked just with a, a block list of known compromised or bad digital signatures. Another just really quick and easy way to say, okay, we know that there's no legitimate use for that. Let's block it right then and there. Um, so with that though, uh, let's uh, move on to yeah. the last section here. Yeah, and by the way, we see your questions, but so people that can need to get off the call can, we'll save them for the end. One of the last things we want to talk about is how the malware hits the endpoint. What is kind of the attack vector? You know, malware can hit endpoints in many ways. It could be an email with an office document or a PDF attached to it. It could be something you encounter through your browser that's taking advantage of something, uh, a flaw in your browser or something to deliver malware, a, a vulnerability. It could actually be a, a, a Windows file, or as you see here, it turns out that the most common way that malware starts on your computer is a script. That could be Visual Basic, JavaScript, or PowerShell script. And by the way, PowerShell is by far the most prominent mes uh, method. I forgot exactly what the 90% is, but of the 83% of things that start with scripts, it's in the 90 percentage that is PowerShell scripts. So whenever we talk about living off the land attack, these scripts, which can be very legitimate, you, especially when they're using tools like PowerShell, that's how bad guys are trying to stay under the radar. But you can see Office documents, PDF documents are bad, but usually it, it's some sort of Windows files or Windows vulnerabilities are the second most predominant way for malware. But to me, the main takeaway of this slide is malicious scripts and living off the land attacks are really becoming the primary game plan for threat actors. And with that, in the last minute, why don't we summarize some final tips? I'll go ahead and start with the first, which is we keep on mentioning living off the land attacks, but we really believe in layered defense. You saw our network security services, they can catch a lot of stagers and downloaders before they even hit the endpoint. And that's fantastic. The whole point of stagers and downloaders and living off the land techniques, it's to try to evade local security. They know you're going to have some sort of endpoint security and the stager is there to try to way, find a way to get past it before it really does the evil stuff it's planning to do. So having network security first gives you an opportunity to kind of get rid of most of those before they hit the endpoint. On the flip side, 
having that endpoint defense is critical. There are attacks that will get past the network. Having something on the endpoint gives you another stage of defense. More importantly, EDR. A lot of people want things like anti-malware to be completely preventative. Of course we do. We just wanted to block something right away. But even endpoint defenses can miss some of these living off the land techniques. And it's really the EDR portion of EPDR that catches a lot of these living off the land indicators of attack. We may not have a signature or thing for sure that could block uh, a particular PowerShell thing that actually looks pretty legitimate. But if we see it inject a process directly on your endpoint, another opportunity to block it. So really with layered defense, think about both network and endpoint, but think about that second stage of endpoint defense that comes with EDR. For the second one, phishing-based threats and just email threats in general remain one of the most prolific attack vectors for starting a, an attack against an organization. If you look at other people's reports too, uh, the FBI puts out their IC3 report every single year, and even they found the overwhelming majority of threats involved business email compromise or phishing related to compromised email accounts. Uh, it was something in the order of millions of dollars in losses because of business email compromise specifically. So this means you need those layers of protection, not just at your perimeter, at the endpoint, but also along your email path as well too. Um, so this includes things like DNS wash to uh, protect against malicious links within an email that a user may click, but also security services to detect and block that fish before it even ends up in your, your inbox as well too, is gonna to be key for keeping your organization safe. And finally, this is kind of just a generic security strategy tip, but in this report, we decided to look at our data with a new perspective. And I suggest you look at your defenses with that same new perspective. There's a lot of security strategy you probably implemented years ago. Some people, they treat a next generation firewall like a set and forget device where you might put it in a closet, get it set up and take some time to secure it that, that first time. Uh, but as long as network and stuff is working, you don't look at it much. You might even suddenly go through a lot of help desk things where marketing suddenly needs a temporary file sharing server that you set up as a policy, but then you forget about. Go back and look at all your defenses. Look at your firewall policy. Are there policies that aren't being used? The Firebox has things like Policy Checker or uh, ways that you can see what policies most of your traffic are going through. I think we call it Policy Map. Uh, look at that, those old security settings you have and make sure there's something that, not anything that doesn't need to be there anymore. But do the same for everything. What about your, your identity provider, your active directory? When's the last time you've looked at the most privileged users or you've looked at how many domain administrator accounts you have? If you're like any average company, you might suddenly add accounts here and there for service accounts for special needs but then you don't need them anymore. And if you're not going back to kind of look at this old stuff from a new perspective, you might end up with a lot of holes or things that you no longer need that are risk. So go back, take some time to look at all of your security strategy with a new perspective to try to get rid of those holes. So with that, I uh, just want to encourage you to check out uh, our podcast, The 443, but also our blog, secplicity.com, where you can also find that threat landscape that you see right here, which has the live view of this report. Uh, for folks that have to go, thank you for joining us. Uh, me and Mark can probably stay on to go through some of these questions. Yeah, there's just a couple, I think, that are left over. Uh, one of them is one I would love to answer is, are there any other vendors endpoint security products recommended as alternatives? Uh, speaking as a WatchGuard employee, the answer to that is no. You should absolutely use WatchGuard EPDR or Panda AD360 if you still have access to that legacy software. Uh, but it, joking aside, EPDR, AD360 are uh, some of the most robust and strong tools that you can have specifically because of that zero trust application service. It not only allows you to do effectively application allow listing without the additional work, but also saves you time from uh, responding to potentially suspicious malware payloads because that just does not exist. I agree 100% with Mark's answer, but I'll even go further and take off my watch guard hat because I know sometimes there's, there's times where you simply already have services. So I think our products have a lot of features that, that differentiate them from others, but we try to genericize our tips in, in our report and even this podcast. So 
when I talk about the difference between preventative endpoint protection known in the industry as EPP and kind of post-execution uh, detection like EDR, while there's things we do specifically others don't, other products out there have both a preventative and sometimes a EDR side of things. So if you are going to look at other products, think of the generic tips we're giving you. Signature only, bad. Think about things that are getting better at machine learning and behavioral analysis. We have great products there, so we're going to recommend ours. But if you're just generically thinking about this, at least go with the products that use the more advanced techniques that we're talking about. Any others you got, Mark? Um, so we answered the IP feed one. Uh, Seth, there's the web blocker chat GPT one. I, I think our current answer, I, well, I'll just start it in one blocker. Where, when will there be an option to block AI sites like chat GPT? I think that's a good and interesting question, but I don't think me and Mark can answer. Uh, we, while we have many different uh, ways of blocking domains, including our own DNS watch service, for web blocker specifically, uh, we partner with, wow, they used to be web sense now they're force point uh, security companies buying security companies but ultimately it's a force point raytheon product i believe i believe raytheon bought, bought them too uh, but in any case i think it's a great question that we will pose some of our product managers because uh, i do think i do definitely think machine learning and large language model sites should be something that is considered as a new category of productivity uh, last one I think that we need to hit is uh, someone pointed out that other industry data trends show that 2022 threat vol volume was on par with 2021. Is it continuing through 2023? Don't want to give up the beans for the uh, Q2 report that we're writing right now, but we do see a similar trend of malware threats are still holding steady from previous years. If you look at the network attack section of this report, you can see it's comparable to previous quarters over the last year as well too. Say the malware trends are holding quite steady as well. Uh, but in our next report, we'll be able to report on that more accurate statistical trend uh, thanks to our new view of those stats. So I think we answered the Firebox rate limiting question. And I think that is uh, basically it. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone for joining and thank you for staying late for the folks that kept the extra eight minutes. Hope you have a lovely day. Uh -huh.